this is Raina Campbell, your chief dream driver, and welcome to the No Parking Podcast, where through conversations and discussions with creators like yourself, we'll find interesting approaches to help you take your dreams out of park, put them in drive, and ride towards success. If I'm talking about, like, making content, if I'm talking about a sub-segment of the black community, like, yeah, no, like, I'm not particularly worried about people wondering if I'm credible or not because I have receipts, like literal physical receipts, uh, digital receipts everywhere on the, on the things that I've been able to accomplish um, in the last you know three and a half years. Don't pigeonhole yourself. Don't talk yourself down. Like it's okay to have crazy ideas and to be want to be really big. Hey, Dream Drivers, welcome to episode 88 of the Dreams and Drive podcast. And today we are going to be speaking with Morgan DeBon, who is the CEO of Blavity. And if you guys haven't heard of Blavity, which I'm sure most of you who are listening to this probably have, it is one of the fastest growing digital media startups and is a top destination for black youth culture. And on this episode, Morgan and I really dive deep into how to take your idea from idea to um, ideation to execution. One of the things that I really wanted her to talk about was each step of the process that she and her team at Blavity had to go through in order to see it all come together. So we talk about from having the idea to figuring out who your target market is, who your audience is, testing it, iterating, scaling, getting funding, All that stuff. Morgan is just so skilled when it comes to all things entrepreneurship, tech, media, and she gives all her best tips in this episode. So I hope that you guys enjoy it. Some of the things that we talk about in this episode are, of course, what inspired Morgan as a child. We also talk about the early days of Blavity, how to validate your idea and outline your target audience, why data is super important, major pivots in the Blavity story, how to know um, if your audience is actually valuable, meaning can you monetize from it, how to be the best and why Morgan thinks this is very uh, crucial for you to aspire to, especially as you're building. We talk about understanding your core competency and positioning. We talk about understanding your core competency and positioning, how to build a strong team and build credibility, the unglamorous side of entrepreneurship, because this stuff is not always so pretty. I think this is going to be an episode that you just want to take notes on just because there's so much that she mentions and I was just so privileged and so honored for her to be on this show. So before we get into the interview, I just want to say thank you to everyone who has already joined our Facebook group. If you want to be part of our private Facebook mastermind, just go to dreamsanddrive.com slash Facebook and you can sign up there. If you want today's show notes, just go to dreamsanddrive.com and click on episode 88. And I'm also, as always, inviting you to follow us on social. We are Dreams and Drive across the board, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for making May such a special month. I'm really appreciative of all the engagement, all the feedback that you guys have given about the stories that we shared, especially those of Nena Stella, which is episode 87, and Sarah Vega. I don't think I've ever seen people talk so much online about any of the episodes prior to these two. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dream Drivers. I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. All right, so let's get into the episode. Hope you guys enjoy. Hi, Morgan. Thank you so much for being a guest on today's episode of Dreams and Drive. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I am so excited to chat with you. Um, as we were talking before, I actually interviewed you in 2014 for a Madame Noir article. So it's going to be great to catch up again and um, see how much Blavity has grown. Yeah, I know that seems like forever ago, but you're, I think, one of the first interviews that I did talking about Blavity. Oh, wow. I feel special. Now we're like, we came full circle, right? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I love to start all our interviews um, with is the question of what inspired you as a child. I think it's really um, important to go back and reflect on those early years. So if I were to ask you, who was Morgan, the nine-year-old, the 10-year-old, what would you say? Um, I was definitely a little on the rambunctious side. I was artsy and like um, probably kind of talkative, but also a loner in some ways. So 
I think from a passion perspective, I just love doing everything. I played soccer. I did Taekwondo. I did glass blowing. I played chess. Like I was doing a lot. So yeah, I had a happy, you had a, a happy 10, nine year old Morgan running around St. Louis. <laughs> glass blowing? What is glass blowing? Um, glass blowing, you can make like ornaments. Um, you can make like glass beads, tons of different things. It's like a torch and glass. It's crazy. So you grew up in St. Louis? Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm from St. Louis. And you ended up going to Washington University, right? Yep. I went to Washington University in St. Louis. So walk me through those early days of Blavity. Like, how did you get the idea? I know you had three other co-founders. What was that like? Yeah. So early days of Blavity, I knew the market that I wanted to serve. Like, I knew I wanted to create something for young black people in America. And I knew that the, I wanted to really focus on creators, makers, people who had like really cool ideas and were already making dope things, but didn't necessarily have a place that was going to promote them or give them visibility mm-hmm. or have the scale to really help them grow. And I also saw and be, kind of became frustrated that um, like peer media companies or legacy media companies that were magazines didn't necessarily um, think about digital first or millennials or like young creators of company of of color, Um, you know, back in those days. Now I think everyone's kind of like on the wave, Mm -hmm. but I think back then it it didn't really exist. And so that was a lot of the inspiration um, for starting to work on their early version of Blavity, which was actually a newsletter. Um, and it was a weekly newsletter that went out with the top black videos that you needed to see kind of like an upworthy, but for Mm -hmm. black people. (laughs) And, um, yeah, that was the first version and it was super simple. Um, and then we just built different things from there. So you said that you knew you wanted to create, um, a community for black people. Like, how did you know you wanted to create this? Because at this point you were in college, right? No, I had graduated. I was working in Silicon Valley um, and had worked for a few years. So I knew that I wanted to create a s- virtual space, um, mm-hmm. you know, based off my experience working at tech company at a big tech company, you know, I had seen other people build products. I had seen what it looked like to design for a specific target audience and the kind of process that you need to go through, um, like user generated, content and like customer empathy and rapid iterations and and things of that nature. And so I applied that, that type of thinking to a a demographic that I was passionate about, which was selfishly me and my friends, (laughs) you know, (laughs) that's not selfish girl. That's not selfish. (laughs) Yeah. So, so that was, that was the, that was the beginning. So at this point, what was the core problem that you were trying to solve with Blavity? So with the first version of Blavity, um, the core problem was it is difficult to find video content that young, smart black people wanted to see. Now, again, you have to remember this was almost three and a half years ago. This was before Facebook started caring about video. This was before Instagram really popped off with video, right? Mm -hmm. This is when Periscope and Vine still existed. So, um, yeah, you gotta, you gotta reel back the, the hands of time. Okay, so you you had this core problem. And one of the things that I really wanted to focus on for a lot of our listeners who are listening in is the whole idea where you have this dream, you have this idea, right? So as we go through the interview, I kind of want you to walk us through the steps. So right now we're in the idea phase, you're in like the testing, you have the idea the research phase. Can you walk us through some of the core things that you were doing, you and your team were doing at this point to really validate the idea to make sure it was something that people actually wanted? Yeah. So we, um, spent a lot of time thinking about user personas and outlining like who is our target customer and Mm -hmm. really, really specific about what that target customer looked like. And so it wasn't, it wasn't like, Oh, like all black people or like all black people between the ages of 18 and 34. Like, Mm -hmm. no, we were like people between the ages of 23 and 28 who lived in these five cities. And by being that specific and outlining exactly who that person was, we were able to make sure that the product that we designed and even the voice and branding and messaging that we created aligned with those user personas. And so, um, yeah, we spent a lot of time 
in the beginning. And I would actually, I wouldn't say a lot of time. We spent a couple of weeks, um, (laughs) before designing like the voice and tone of the brand to make sure that we were really specific about who we were targeting. Not to say that other people may not also enjoy that voice, Mm -hmm. but that we weren't necessarily speaking to them, right? Like lots of white people listen, watch, read Blavity. Um, but we're not speaking to them. We don't speak to, to that demographic intentionally. Why was this part of the process so important for you? Um, I think it's important to anyone because Mm -hmm. it makes sure that you are intentional about what you're creating. Um, and for Blavity, you know, in the beginning, it's impossible to try to please everyone. And so we wanted to be specific, um, and make sure that we really captured the demographic that we cared the most about in the beginning. So it's really just a prioritization thing and making sure that we're not wasting time building something for people we don't even, we're not trying to actually hit. How did you build the site at this point? Did you have someone on your team? Did you work with outside developers at this point? What was that like? No. So the first iteration of the site, um, what what was, it was the first iteration of the product was MailChimp. So Mm -hmm. that's super easy. I did it myself. Um, and then the website, so then the MailChimp link to a website, which my co-founder, Jeff, who's an engineer built. And then it turns out that people didn't actually want the version that we built. And so over the weekend, one day I built a WordPress site, um, and that was the version that they liked better. And so we switched from a custom, um, you know, hand built, super techie product to a WordPress site that took me 48 hours to make. Um, and went from there and we had a WordPress, um, we used WordPress for almost a year or actually more than a year, um, before we, we went back and rebuilt, uh, and built a new content management system that's Blavity owned and operated. How did you know that they didn't like that first version of the site? Um, data. I mean, everything is trackable now. And I think it's, it's on every founder and creator and hustler to know the data that's actually behind what people are doing and saying and interacting with your product or your service. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we are ruthless now and have been for years about tracking growth, tracking click throughs, tracking comments, engagement. And, um, I mean, we, I always have Google analytics real time, on my screen. Like I always know exactly how many people are on each one of our websites. And in fact, I think it's so weird at this point, I can literally predict like, Hmm, I don't feel like I've seen enough tweets today. Like our site probably at this number right now. And, um, yeah, it's people need to know their audience and know their demographic and know what's hitting and what's not, because it's not just about gut. You should know the data. Wow. So wait, Google Analytics allows you to have like a plugin that you can just stay on your desktop? Um, no, it's a web web page. I mean, I'm sure they probably somebody somewhere oh, probably you mean made you just, that. You just keep it up. You just keep it open all the time and see how it is, how it's performing. Yes, I have a tab. It's on my my mobile phone. I've got the mobile app. Absolutely. What metrics were you all tracking? Like what specific web metrics were you looking at? So with the newsletter for our MVP, I tracked opens, uh, click through rates of our, of the videos that were in there and then shares of the video to friends mm-hmm. or shares of the video to social networks. All right. So when, and then for the actual site, what metrics are you, were you looking at? In the beginning or now? Um, let's do in the beginning. And then as we kind of get to the next stage, we'll talk about what metrics you're looking at, what you're looking at now. So in the beginning, the metrics that I looked at when on the website, once we went from the newsletter to the website, um, were shares. The thing that's most important um, for growth and kind of public sentiment is um, like how quickly and how viral can you be? Mm -hmm. Um, And so that to me was a reflection of shares and people sharing with their friends, sharing content, sharing the website, sharing the brand. Um, so that was the metric that, that we tracked. So at what point were you in the, or how long did you guys stay in that version one of the site? So you had moved past the newsletter. You actually had a site up and running. How long were you in this stage for? So we went from newsletter to a website that we built from scratch for about three weeks Mm -hmm. to website that V1 of website on WordPress for about probably a month and a half to V2 on WordPress. Like we iterate very quickly. Um, 
between, so it's probably around a two month, eight week cycle, learning cycle with any kind of like big, big change. Mm -hmm. And I think in our first interview, you mentioned that you do a lot of the lean startup methodologies in, in the business. Are you still applying those principles today? Yeah, absolutely. Every day, all day, I literally just left a brainstorm with the team. So <laughs> that's, that's just quarter our, our company culture at this point. What do brainstorms with the team look like for you all? Like, is it, is it very, um, do, are you guys very process oriented or are they just kind of like big creative brainstorms? Um, they are organized chaos for sure. <laughs> so, I mean, I think the, the goal of any brainstorm is to let people be a little bit more free than they are in their kind of day-to-day -day routines. Mm -hmm. Um, and to think big and think crazy. And so it's lots of stickies, it's whiteboards, it's markers, it's pins, it's laughs. It's like, it's everything. Um, and then we take the good stuff from the brainstorm and then try to say, okay, based off of what we just did, like what are the business implications of that or what are the things that we want to move forward with? Okay. Okay. So when did you guys come to the moment where you realized, all right, we need to make another big shift in how we're thinking about Bla what Blavity is? Um, I don't know if we've ever had a shift in what Blavity, in the vision of what Blavity is. Mm -hmm. I think um, but Blavity is, is still on track to hit the vision of where we want to go. Mm -hmm. I think, um, and, and to be totally truthful, I am agnostic about how we get there, right? Like if it means like that we are creating content and creating a platform for other people to submit content so that they can share their ideas. If it means that we need to do an event, if it means that we need to partner with foundations and nonprofits, like mm -hmm. then that's what we're going to do. Um, we're very flexible about how we get to our end goal, which is to have positive experiences online and offline for people of color and, and across the world. So, um, you know, I think to me, it's all about the data. So if we're slowing down in one part of the business, then we need to look at it and say, did we reach our peak? Do we not have the right team? Do we not have the right resources? Do we need, is the market changing? Is this no longer relevant? Were we too early? Like the Blavity video website was too early. People didn't need it. People didn't think about it. I feel like if we launched it now, it would pop, right? So, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you just have to look and evaluate all the time and, and be willing to be flexible and how you still achieve your mission or your vision. So when was a time or maybe you can walk us through a moment in the history of the brand where you realized that you had to pivot and how did that pivot look in real time? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I think the first pivot was the newsletter to the website and then the website to the WordPress website. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think another pivot was when we were, we were a remote company, everybody was working across the country. And then we made the decision to physically get an office and put people in one place. Um, and we realized that because we were getting too big where it was miscommunications and it wasn't as efficient. People needed to have a space to collaborate and have that routine and have that structure of physically going somewhere every day. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was another one that we did about this time last year where we got our first office and moved to LA. Um, let's see. I mean, we pivot all the time. Like that's just the nature of a startup is like we pivot. I feel like I pivot every five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Does that ever get overwhelming as a leader of the business or is that just the nature of the game? Well, I think what's overwhelming is, um, all the opportunities and all the choices that I constantly have to make, mm -hmm. right? Like I feel like I'm always, I make a thousand decisions a day, like way more than the average person working a normal nine to five, because I have to make decisions about my, my life. I have to make decisions for the team. I have to make decisions as a manager. I have to make decisions as a CEO with investors. Um, and you know, all of my decisions, I have to look at all those audiences and say, how is this going to impact people, um, and those stakeholders. So yeah, I think the decision-making, um, part of a pivot or changing, changing directions is, is definitely overwhelming at times for sure. What's one decision you had to make today? Today? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a thousand. Like, um, I'm trying to think of something I can tell you that's not like super proprietary. <laughs> um, 
we are renting out some of our office space today. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just had to make a decision about where and how much of the space we actually want to rent out and have other people all up in our office. So that was one where it was like, all right, this will impact everyone. Whether we have 10 people in the office or four people in the office makes a big difference in terms of foot traffic. You guys are located in, you're in Cal, you're in Los Angeles, right? Mm-hmm, okay, yep. okay. How is it like over there? I've never been to LA. What do you, how do you like living in LA as a CEO, as a creative, as a female? Like, is it somewhere that you would recommend for other, um, people who are creative lifestyle entre- entrepreneurs to, to dwell? Yeah. I mean, I think LA is beautiful and I think that is inspiring. Like the city is beautiful. The people are beautiful. Like the art is beautiful. There's art everywhere and people are always making things. I mean, LA is based in the film and media and content business. Mm -hmm. And I think that's super interesting because it's all about storytelling. It's just different mediums of storytelling. and, And I found that really inspiring. Um, I think that it's incredibly expensive. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's the place to start your side hustle because mm-hmm. um, you're not going to be able to have as much liquid capital to invest in yourself and invest in your business because you're going to pay rent um, versus a city like Philly or New Orleans or Detroit. Like a little goes a long way. Um, so you might have a little bit more wiggle room with your idea. I think that if you're in the content business, then LA is a great place to be for sure. Content, uh, any specific type of content or, um, just general content? Uh, I would say, uh, video mm-hmm. or digital media. I wouldn't say if you're a writer, this is the best place to be. Yeah. Video, digital media, influencers, So at this point, right, you know, with any idea, any business at some point, you I don't know if when you guys first started it, if you were doing a lot of um, you were doing a lot of bootstrapping. I don't know if that was coming from personal funds, but at some point you want to be able you want your business to be sustainable and you have to start monetizing. How did how did you guys at Blavity start doing that and what did that look like? And maybe you can give some tips for other people who may be trying to build their own media platforms on ways to truly figure out how to monetize. Yeah, so we um, we bootstrapped with my personal money for a little over a year, and um, so monetization was definitely a part of of how we thought about the business from day one. Um, because every dollar we made was money that we could reinvest, um, and another day or another two days that we could buy being independent without having to have take on investor money. Mm-hmm. Um, So the first thing that we sold was probably an Instagram ad. So like super simple, $50, $100 to post on Instagram. We grew an audience large enough um, and then started accepting ads. Um, And then from there, we tested a lot of different things. We tested, we charged, we used to charge people for tweets. Like really? Like brands or creatives? whoever it didn't matter. Like <laughs> it's a, Blavity is a business, you know? And, um, I mean, think about it, like Airbnb sold like cereal or maybe that was Pinterest. One of them sold like cereal when they first started, you know, like when you're starting up, you do what it takes to make money so you can keep going and keep investing. I mean, we literally today had a meeting about, Hey, what are the things that we're missing in terms of monetizing what we have and monetizing the properties that we own and monetizing the brand equity that we have? Do we need to be doing more events? Do we need to be thinking about other digital products we can create? I love that you mentioned the idea that, you know, you said Blavity was a business. And I think a lot of times, especially people who are building creative platforms or platforms for creators, sometimes you can get caught up in the in the mission and not necessarily thinking about, all right, but this is still a business. Did you always think of Blavity as a business and the way you approached it as a business from the beginning? Or was it something that you uh, worked, you developed over time? Um, no, Blavity was always a business mm-hmm. because I was in San Fran- downtown San Francisco. I couldn't afford to just like live a life of, yeah, I'm just going to like hang out in downtown San Francisco <laughs> with my insane rent and like spend my money. Like that is it. I don't have that kind of money, um, or that kind of 
no, Blavity was always a business. And I think from a social change perspective, it's better as a business because we're reinvesting money back into the black community every day. Like whenever everything from like the cleaners who clean our office to the vendors who do our photo booths at our events to like photographers that we bring in or film producers, like those are all black people that we pay money, real cash money and mm-hmm. hire to, and that's just like operating, right? Not to mention most of my employees are people of, or all of my employees are people of color. Um, and so yeah, a business, I think for me was the way that I can make an impact and an investment in the community and, and fulfill that vision, um, and my personal mission. What tips would you have for, you know, someone who is struggling to figure out how to monetize, monetize their platform? Yeah. You know, I think monetizing a platform is difficult. And I think, um, people really have to ask themselves, like, do you, what you have, does it have value? Like just because you think it's cute or fun, is it something someone will pay for? And I think people should ask themselves that question probably earlier than they typically do. I think what happens is people are like, I'm so passionate. I love this. I love this audience. And it's like, that audience is like five people, you know, like you're a sub segment of a segment, sub sub segment of a sub segment. Like it's not big enough to get a sponsorship from AT&T. Now, if you don't want a sponsorship from AT&T, that's fine. But then don't be upset when you're not getting 100K deals because the only people who can give you that are big multinational companies, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's the kind of money that you need sometimes when you want to build like a scalable business with employees. Now, if you want to build a lifestyle business where it's like you, maybe like two other people and like contractors, I think that's fantastic. And I think that's great. And in my next life, I probably will do that. <laughs> um and, and that's different, right? You can build a little bit slower and you can think about, okay, particularly if you're selling like yourself, like as a consultant or a service that you're giving mm-hmm. and charging for that, like, I think those are great businesses and you don't have to have a huge audience. You could sell a service to a sub segment of a sub segment of a sub segment. You just need to be the best at that, right? So be specific. So if someone was like, I am a expert on Instagram growth for women focused e-commerce businesses, particularly in the shoes and accessory category. That person could easily make a ton of money because there are so many businesses that want that very specific thing. And I would much rather hire an expert in something that specific than someone who's like, I'm really good at growing Instagram businesses. And I'm like, okay, cool. But like, I have this type of business and this is what I'm trying to grow. And if I can find someone who knows how to do that, exactly that I'm willing to pay a premium for that person. So I think people really need to think critically about what their business model is, what they're offering, if they're offering a service or the target audience that they're selling to or selling to someone else, if they're you know selling ads or something, is it big enough? Are they really the dominant person in that market? How do you know, if your audience is valuable. Are other people buying things or selling things to that audience? Okay. And then you look at it from there and figure out, maybe talk us through the next steps then. So let's give me a, give me a fake audience or give me a real Um, audience. Okay. Let's say you want, um, 20 year old, 20 to 25 year old, um, college graduates who like video games <laughs> okay great perfect um i'm gonna also say they're black okay yes that's, that's <laughs> so black video gamers post-grad um and that's the audience that you're going to curate and you want to know is that is that enough for me to make money my answer is like hell yeah you can make a lot of money there because one that audience spends money because they are like loyal and obsessive right? Like they will play video games for hours and they want to connect with other black video gamers. Like it's a, it's a good demographic. Um, two do people because they spend money, that means that advertisers are going to be interested in capturing them. So they're going to say, okay, how do we get the black gamer market 
And can we sell them conference tickets to go to Comic-Con? Can we sell them costumes because they want to dress up to go to Mm Comic-Con? Can we sell them new games? Can we promote our new release of the new game? Can we do exclusives with the creators? Can we give them special stickers and avatars and things that they can buy digitally, right? Like there's so many things to sell this audience. and, And that's how I would process that demographic, right? And I say, okay, now I, as the creator, need to be the number one and and potentially only black video game community content site lifestyle brand. And I need to make it accessible for people to buy and spend money and spend money with me. And then that's what I would go build. If anyone's listening and you are trying to speak to this audience, <laughs> Morgan just gave you the formula. <laughs> go <So> make it. <laughs> you said, you know, one of the things you said earlier was you have to also figure out how to be the best. What mm-hmm. did figuring out how to be the best at what you all at Blavity are building look like? Like, how did well, you guys? Last... Mm-hmm. Yeah. The first thing is we didn't pick something that we didn't know anything about, right? Like, I didn't say I'm going to build a black mom's media company. I'm not a mom. Like, that's not my core competency. All my co-founders are men, right? So we picked a demographic that we knew because we were a part of it. And we picked, um, like, from a from a positioning perspective, we also looked at the market and said, are there other black media companies that we personally love? And at the time, the answer was no. Like, no, you know, Essence, Ebony, all these other companies, we didn't necessarily identify them as a lifestyle brand that we wanted to partake in, right? Like our non-black peers had Refinery29 and um, like ESPN and um, Bustle and Thrillist and all these other sites. We didn't have any, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was easy to say, do we have competitors? Okay. Do we have peers that are doing the exact same thing that we want to be doing, but just not for our demographic? Yes. Is the market big enough? Yes. Can we make money because black people spend money? Our demographic spends money and, or advertisers or big brands are interested in this demographic. Yes. Yes. Great. This is a good place for us to be. Now, what's the solution? How do we capture them? We don't know. That's what we got to figure out, right? We started with the newsletter. We went to the website that didn't work. We went to WordPress website. We then decided, oh, we need to go over here. Oh, we need to do a conference. You know, you just keep going. So before we head into the next part, I want to ask you, what if you do that whole process and you realize there's like four to five other people already doing what you want to do? Would you say niche it down even more or would you say figure out how to do something different? Mm, It depends on the scenario. So like, I mean, there's lots of options. You could partner, you could buy them, you could merge with them, you could be more specific, but you have to be more specific without cutting down your revenue potential. Mm -hmm. Um, you could be more broad. You could, I mean, there's so many different ways. It really depends on the market. Like there are people now who are creating sites who are competitors to Blavity, right? And they're like, we're going to be more intellectual. We're going to be more editorial focused. We're going to be more video focused, right? And we're going to only focus on women or we're only going to focus on men, right? But there's so many like, and, and that's fine. And some of those might work. Um, or, or maybe they won't because they're too small. Who knows? Mm-hmm. What was the major challenge that you faced when building Blavity? And how did you, you and your team work through that? The biggest challenge in the beginning was, I think to some extent, was like, are we big enough to raise money, to keep going, to really build this? Is this going to be big? Do we want this to be big? (laughs) Like now that we know the amount of work that it takes, like, is this something that everybody personally wants? And when I say everybody, I mean me and my co-founders, do we personally all want to commit to doing this? Because it is a lot of work and it's a lot of sacrifice and you lose a lot of things, a lot of freedom, um, running a, a, a large medium size, you know, small business, Um, and I think it's really difficult to run a business when you, without all the resources, um, that other businesses may have at your size. What kind of resources were you guys lacking that other businesses might have had that would have helped them during that stage? 
Um, I mean, all small businesses need more money. More <laughs> yes, more help, yes. Right? Like, <laughs> blavity, anybody's business is like, how do I find better people? How do I spend less money and make more money? And I don't have enough time. So, that, I mean, those are certainly the same challenges that we have. Why the decision to raise money? Or what, what, what did that conversation look like? And what happened once you guys committed to, all right, we need to, we're going to go after VC funding. Um, it was too expensive for us to pay for ourselves, for me to pay for myself. Let me be specific. Mm -hmm. It was too expensive. Like it was costing more. And at this point it was clear if we had more money, we would make more money. And it was like a clear, if we put in $50,000 into the business, we will come out with 75,000. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and we know how to grow from there and we need more wiggle room to make more changes and experiments and make mistakes. And we don't want our mistakes to mean that people that we go bankrupt, right? Mm -hmm. That we have to close down the business. Like if Blavity makes mistakes today, the business doesn't go down, right? Um, if we make big mistakes, we could, but hopefully we're not making big mistakes anymore. Um, and the, the venture funding situation was, um, was the right call for Blavity at the time because, I mean, taking out a loan, you could do that, but there's a, there's like structural implications to taking out a bank loan versus taking out a convertible note with investors. Um, it's more flexible. There's, it's more like lenient. Um, so, so that's the route that we went. Mm -hmm. You, you just seem so knowledgeable. And I know that this is something that you've definitely learned over the years. You definitely have done research. You didn't go to school. You didn't get a degree in like business or anything, did you? <laughs> I have a minor in entrepreneurship, but that's okay, okay. literally just them giving me credit for <laughs> doing what I was already doing. <laughs> so how did you kind of teach yourself what it would, you know, how did you teach yourself how to be a, a CEO? of a, a tech company? Um, I don't think that it was a result of teaching myself. I think it's trial and error. Like mm -hmm. I was observant. I talked to a lot of people. I listen. I listen a lot. I'm um, not scared to say what I don't know. Like all the time, like, I don't know. <laughs> what do you guys think? You know? Um, and, and then I just keep going. I mean, I fail a ton um, all the time. And I think I have really smart people around me, people who are smarter than me. And that's really helpful. And that gives me the wiggle room to be a flawed leader. Um, and it's really about the team and the people that I have around me for sure. Mm -hmm. And the team is so important. I know Jonathan Jackson is actually somebody that I know he's friends with one of my close friends from like uh, middle school, Amina, and we, we connected and you definitely, I've never met your other co-founders, but how do you build a strong team? If you're somebody who, you know, at some point you can't do it all yourself, what are the key things that you look for when you're bringing someone new on, on the Blavity, Blavity team? So the things that I look for, um, one, do they have the skills to do the, fix the problem that we have in the role that we were opening? Mm -hmm. Um, cause right now it's nice and cute if you're smart and you work hard, but if you can't fix the problem at this point, you're not doing anything. <laughs> um, in the beginning it was like, cool, you're hustling, you're passionate, lit. Cause we have so many things that you could do. Like if it doesn't work here, you can go over there. Right. In the company. So now we're definitely more um, specific about do you have the skill set that we need to get to the next level? And then two is passion. Always like, are you passionate? Uh, do you really care about the audience and that we're serving? Like, is this a mission for you? Is this something that will motivate you? Because it's hard. Blavity is not an easy place to work. Like everybody wants to work here. It is not easy. And you can ask my team I and mean, they're sitting there probably looking at me like, why am I talking to myself? But they're <laughs> like, like, we work really hard and it's oftentimes thankless. And, um, I think, that you have to be motivated by more than just money. Cause we also don't pay like big companies pay. Right. And you've got to be able to say like, why would I wake up at six o'clock to answer, take this East coast call? Cause it's the right thing to do. Cause you know that it's going to make an impact. It's going to make an impact on the business. It's going to make an impact on your personal life. It's going to make an impact on the mission that, that you as a teammate or an employee set out. And I think when finding teammates and looking for teammates, you should really evaluate 
Like what are the things that are important and what are going to help you hit your goals as a business owner or creator? Um, and you know, I definitely think it's skills and then passion. Have you had to let anyone go yet? Yeah, girl. <laughs> That's just part of it. You How know? does that work? I mean, I, I'm like a one man, to, one man show at this point. But, you know, definitely one of my goals with Dreams and Drive is to build it into something larger than it is now. But my personality type, I don't think I'd be able to be. I don't think I'd be able to be the one to do the firing. And I, that's that's what I'm saying now. Yes, but you can. How did Anyone you? Can do it. How did you like say to you know to someone say, "Hey, we gotta, you gotta go." <laughs> how did that work? Or how did that look, conversation look? <laughs> there's so many. I mean, like the first person I really fired probably um, was probably a writer. Like it's like these are the rules and guidelines. And then it's like, you didn't do follow the rules or the guidelines. And then we reminded you, you didn't follow the rules or the guidelines. And then you did it again. And then it's like, okay, these are the rules and guidelines. And then you do it a second time. You got to go. No, you're not listening. Right. So, um, yeah, probably the early days was, was a writer that we let go. Um, it's hard. I mean, it's hard to, to, to tell someone that they are no longer working or a part of this mission and this vision. I think that, the question that I ask myself is like, am I doing a disservice to their teammates, their colleagues and to the business as an entity to keep this person on? Have I done everything that I can do as a leader to like offset the situation? Um, is there any more, are there any more actions that I can do that would actually make an impact on whether this person will be able to perform or not? The answer is like, no. And yes, it is not fair to the team um, to keep this person on or to prevent somebody else from coming onto the team because we don't have the head count for it, mm-hmm. then, then it's just time for them to move on. Now we will help people get other jobs and like we leave, you know, people when they move on to other opportunities, it's relatively cordial. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you've got to evaluate it all the time for sure. So we have a listener question, um, and this one is coming from Mary, and her question is, do you ever worry if people question your credibility? <laughs> uh, I guess it depends on in what world. Like, mm-hmm. if I'm if I'm uh, saying something, I try not to talk about things I don't know about. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing. <laughs> so, you know, if I'm like, if someone's like, hey, and I'm like, Morgan, can you talk about like how you're an expert cook? And I'm like, yeah, like I use these knives and this is what <laughs> I do. And like, I'm the best cook ever. Like, okay. I just lost lots of credibility because I know nothing <laughs> right about mm-hmm. cooking. Someone's like, if I'm talking about being a black female founder, if I'm talking about running a media company, if I'm talking about running a small business, if I'm talking about like making content, um, if I'm talking about a sub segment of the black community, like, yeah, no, like I'm not particularly worried about people wondering if I'm credible or not because I have receipts, like literal physical receipts uh, digital receipts everywhere on the, on the things that I've been able to accomplish um, in the last you know three and a half years. And another question is, what are some of the unglamorous reality no one talks about when it comes to entrepreneurship that you've faced? Um, when I first started Blavity, I gained like fifteen pounds because I wasn't moving because I was living and working in my apartment. So I would go from my bedroom to my <laughs> living room, which I turned into my office. And was like ordering food, um, with all these apps and yeah, I don't think that I really paid attention <laughs> to my physical being cause I was so focused and working so hard. Um, and I think people overlook like just the amount of pure hours that these things take and, uh, it's nonstop. Like I can tell you the times that I've like slept and like hung out probably more than I can tell you the times that I've been, um, or less than I can tell you the times that I've been working. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think it's just a lot of hours and, um, manual labor to get these types of things off the ground and running. And I think that's what scares a lot of people from continuing on, right. They may, they may taste it. They're like, Oh my God, this was more work than I, than I expect. And they just stop. Do you think those are the people that should stop? Or do you think that, you know, it's, it's something that if you survive it, you know, you were made to do it. Um, I think the people who stop should stop. And I think the people who persevere should continue to persevere. Um, I think, that it is hard work and it's not suited for everybody. And I wouldn't necessarily wish the level of stress 
on anybody, like you have to opt into this life. Um, so, so yeah, I think you got to follow your gut. And what, what does it mean to have Blavity be a tech company versus a, you know, media or content creation company? Like what's that difference? Like what's the, what's the importance of having that difference? Um, well, we started in the Bay area, all my founders, co-founders worked at tech companies before they worked at Blavity before I stole them. Um, (laughs) and it's just our process. Like we think through things like a startup because we are one and we build solutions to problems whether those are digital solutions or physical solutions. We iterate through like being a startup and being a tech company is a lot of times about process and thinking. And I think from a content and entertainment perspective, every single studio right now is considering building an OTT, a streaming site. That's a tech product, right? Mm -hmm. Every single, would you call Netflix a entertainment company or a tech company? I mean, yeah, it is a tech company that makes entertainment products. (laughs) Right. But when we first, before they started doing all these Netflix originals, before all that, Mm -hmm. we loved them because they knew what we wanted to watch before we did. That is true. And that's tech right? They weren't just Amazon video or Blockbuster. And so, you know, I think that's the same approach that we use and that's built into our DNA. And um, it's incredibly important in in our ability to move quickly and to be agile. So what metrics, I think we mentioned this earlier, what metrics are you tracking now on the Blavity site? Um, Well, it's difficult, I think, to track one metric right now because... Mm -hmm the world is shifting. Like people are going to, you know, blavity.com at the same rate, but we should be growing, but they're going to social media, right? They're going to Instagram and Twitter and they're going to our events. And so the Blavity brand recognition has never been stronger. And we grow every month Mm -hmm. in terms of people knowing that we exist and knowing what we stand for. Um, so we're still struggling to figure out what is that metric? How does one measure like brand affinity and, um, people liking what you stand for and the creators that you promote um, and the content that you make or the experiences that you make. So, you know, we look at monthly unique visitors. We look at subscribers to our daily newsletter. We look at people checking out 2190, our new women's brand. We look at, um, like, we look at a lot of different things, but there is no one metric at this point, I wish that there was mm-hmm. like there used to be. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a smattering of things. So as we wind down, Morgan, I want to make sure that I ask you this, like what's something, what keeps you motivated? Like what, what are, what's, what was the point where you felt like giving up and how did you work through that? Um, my, my team like motivates me like every day. Um, you, stuff doesn't always work out. You lose clients. You don't hit goals. Um, you don't raise the amount of money that you want, or you you don't have a good investor call. And sometimes I have those meetings, like you know, I'm in the zone in my office or sitting at my desk, and I'm like in it, you know, and I'm not necessarily feeling the best. And then I look up, and someone's like Millie rocking, you know, <laughs> like, and I'm like, oh my god, so they don't bad. do that in my <laughs> office, <laughs> right? Exactly. Or someone's like, you know, like they're, they're cooking their breakfast on the stove. And I'm like, what did you bring? Like, what is happening right now? You know, and I think just remembering that we're all human and like leaning on the team and knowing that it's okay for me not to be perfect and knowing that if we have a problem or we have something we need to work on, like, I don't have to put that all on myself. I can ask for help. Um, and in my the people around me, my support system, my, my co-founders, Jonathan, Jeff, and Aaron, like they lift me up all the time when I need it. So yeah, definitely having the, the, the squad around me helps a lot. So let's move into our lightning round, Morgan. So at this point of the interview, I'm going to give you a prompt and I want you to tell me the first word that comes to mind. All right. Sure. All right. The first word is park. Trees. Uh, reverse. Cars. Neutral. Uh, color palettes. And drive. Blavity. And you know, last <laughs> but not least, if you want to be a dream driver, you have to have like your keys to success. So what are three things that you think every dream driver needs in their toolkit before they hit the road? 
Um, work smarter, not harder. It's not always about like literally sweat equity. It's about how the impact of that sweat equity. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help. Like surround yourself with, with positive, smart people who can help you along the way that offset the things that you're not good at and dream big. Like don't pigeonhole yourself. Don't talk yourself down. Like it's okay to have crazy ideas and to be, want to be really big. Yes. Those are all such amazing pointers, Morgan. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Can you tell our dream drivers where they can find you online? Yes. You can find me online at Morgan Debon everywhere on the internet. And you can find Blavity at, at Blavity. Um, 2190, our new women's brand, it's 21, the number, and then spelled out 90. And then our other new brand, shadowandact.com. You know what? I definitely forgot to, here I am, we're just talking. I forgot to ask you about 2190 and Shadow and Act. Sorry, listeners. You know, sometimes you just get caught up in the conversation. I definitely have questions to ask you about that, but our time is kind of running out, so I don't want to um, leave you. I don't want to um, start talking about it, and then we're not really going in depth, so thank you for mentioning that. One thing I want to ask you, Morgan, is what kind of legacy do you want to leave? You know, in a 100 years... What do you want people to remember about Morgan? Um, That Morgan worked hard and helped create really dope things for black people in this world. What's the dopest Blavity experience you've had thus far? I don't know. I love everything. Like <laughs> I think everything we do is great. I'm super biased. I think Afrotech is, is one that I was really proud of. Empower Her Women's Conference is super mm-hmm. dope. Um some of our video series that are coming out this summer are pretty extraordinary. So I'm excited for everybody to see those. So TBD to be continued. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Talk to you soon. All right. All right. So that's a wrap for episode 88 with Morgan. I hope that you enjoyed her dream driving story as well as her keys to success. Morgan laid the blueprint for what you need to do if you have an idea and you want to actually plan it out, get it started and see if it's something that you can actually grow a business from. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Morgan. I was super appreciative of talking to you because there was just so much that I learned from this episode as well. If you want the show notes from today's episode, just go over to dreamsanddrive.com and click on episode 88 and you can get links to uh, all the resources we mentioned. You can even uh, read the 2014 interview that I did with Morgan or Madame Noir. Um, It was just so, so crazy for her to say that I was one of the first interviews that she ever did. You know, that story of how that happened was actually because I knew one of her co- well, one of my best friends was knew one of her co-founders and he was like, yo, Blavity, it's about to be hot. Ah, you gotta interview Morgan. She's great. You know, Blavity's gonna be the next big thing. And I was like, hey, I'm I'm starting, you know, I'm starting to interview entrepreneurs. Okay, let me interview the next big thing. And it's just so crazy how three years later Blavity really is, you know, one of the hottest up and coming, well not even up and coming, one of the hottest uh destinations for black uh, millennials now. So if it I think this just goes to show just how much with time, with effort, with commitment to execution, with with consistency, with uh, focusing on improving, how much can happen in three years? So if anyone here has an idea and you're not sure where, where it will be in the future, use this episode with Morgan as somebody who started from like the ground up and is really building something for the culture and something that is going to be impacting um, a lot of black millennials lives from now and for the future. So thank you Morgan one last thing please 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 join our private Facebook mastermind group if you want to join just go to dreamsanddrive.com slash Facebook you can fill out your information there and then you'll be directed to the group and you can access everything there episode 89 is next and we're 11 episodes from episode 100 this is crazy you guys crazy a lot of people have been telling me that I should do a live episode That only gives me 11 weeks if I just do one episode a week, which is kind of scary, but maybe it can be done. I don't know. We'll see. We will see. That's why you have to get in the Facebook group and let me know what you think. (laughs) All right, guys, keep dreaming, keep driving, and we will chat again in episode 89.